There was no actual word for gay. There was homosexual, queer, faggot, foto, maricon. The cut didn't care about us, or the politicians didn't care about us. All we wanted was to be loved. Equality is for everyone. The cops came in, harassed the woman, and we retaliated. I'm a sophomore at Stanford University. I'm a 17-year-old activist. I have two moms, and I'm just wondering how the activism in the 60s shaped my parents' lives today. I know from history class that the 50s was a time of a lot of hostility and conformity, and the 60s really shifted that, and I'm curious to see how that affected the LGBT movement. I think it's so important to get youth involved in projects like this to, you know, teach everyone else about where we've come and where we're gonna go. How did they go from being a quiet, closeted community to being out and proud? What was it like? What was it like growing up? What was it like being gay in the 60s? Those 10 years, I think, changed the world. I was from a very small town in Ohio, maybe 2,000 people, 86 in my graduating class, seven of us went to college. I mean, it was, uh, you know, the 1960s, early 60s when I was in high school. Your friends, you said you were pretty popular. How did they react when you came out and told them that you were gay? Well, I think they didn't know until Facebook, but, you know, I didn't really know I was gay. I look back on it now, and I'm like, oh, duh. But at the time, I didn't realize it. And it wasn't really until I went to college and I went, oh, I see. I like women. <laughs> I was called to go on a mission for my church. I had been ordained a deacon. I had been ordained a priest. And it was normal for the, the youth in, in my church to go on missions. So when they called me, I refused to go. And uh, so my family had saved a whole lot of money uh, to, to sustain the mission for three years, and they asked me, what did I want to do with the money? So I said, well, I'd like to go to San Francisco, and I wanted to study at the San Francisco Ballet. The other students at the San Francisco Ballet, uh, many of them were gay, and so they were very accepting. It wasn't threatening. It was a very artistic and welcoming environment. Politically, there wasn't all that much happening. It was, seemed more about letting people know that they weren't mentally ill. That seemed to be the main thing. I was born in San Bernardino, California, from immigrants. I've lived in the Bay Area more than 40 years. I can go back to where I was five years old and start sharing my life. And eyes just opened up, you know, because they think that I came from middle class America. I came out of a cold water flat with an outhouse. You're growing up and you go a day, two days without food. You know, that's not easy. And then you say, I don't want to do that anymore. I, I want those, I want those finer things in life. Mm -hmm. I want that, I want that crystal. I want that china. <laughs> and it's just materialistic things, mm -hmm. but um, I didn't have those things growing up. And I wanted those things. I said, aha, uh -huh. that's the kind of bar I like. <laughs> That's the kind of uh, man I like, and that's what I'm going to go to. And it was amazing it, how, how it completely opened up. Everything, my whole life, you know, everything started opening. I was born a little boy. Just being feminine made you different. I knew I was different, but I didn't know how different till later in life. Me and my Best friend used to play hooky from school and come to San Francisco on the Greyhound bus because it was la la land for us because nobody was making fun of you. I was with a lover. I was around 17 or 18 and I broke up with him and he was going with my best friend so I decided to ask my mother to, that I was going to join the military. I thought, well, if the military wouldn't make me a man, nothing would. I went to Ohio State in the fall of 1968. And as you might imagine, I was like a farm girl in this big campus. It was very overwhelming. And a lot of things were going on then. So I was having to form opinions at 19 years old about the war, about civil rights, about all these things. And um, it had a great impact on me and probably affected me the rest of my life. We went to one gay organization and they were very conservative. I remember when they asked if there were any questions, I stood up and asked them, uh, shouldn't we demonstrate for equal rights and acceptance? And they said, no, 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 no. Um, 
just be quiet and calm and, and we'll fit in and eventually, you know, things will change. You see, one of the premises of Vanguard was it was about equality, it was about direct democracy, it was about acceptance and uh, uh, standing up for one's rights. What was it like growing up in the 60s and knowing that if you came out, it wasn't socially acceptable? In the Latino culture, it doesn't matter what you do. We just don't want to talk about it. Hmm? I knew it in Spanish and I knew it in, uh, in English, the things, but then the words were too vulgar for me, you know? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't like those words. And so I just let that ride and be who I was. I went through boot camp. Every 24 hours I had to lower my voice. One day they were asking people to volunteer to go to Vietnam. I volunteered for the simple reason that hopefully I would get killed and all this pain and hurt would be gone. And then one day I was unloading cargo from a ship. And then I says, oh no, sister, <laughs> I'm done. This is not <laughs> for me. Things started to change uh, in the 60s, uh, particularly because of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, also because of the hippies, also the free speech movement in Berkeley. There was so much going on that the times really were changing. We had the first Catholic president and the first assassination. The voting age came down and I was able to vote for Kennedy. Mm -hmm. The flower children, the hippies. I mean, there was such an influence to the gay community of being free of being loved, of being, that's all we wanted to. I think the hippie generation had a lot to do with our coming to our full circle. Now we could wear long hair. Now we could dress like women. But if the cops stopped you, you had to wear something male underneath, like a male underwear. Because that would, if you didn't have that, you would be impersonating a female. It was against the law in the first place to dress like a woman. It was against the law to be a homosexual. My friends were being arrested and carted away. It made me really distrust the government. We now have documents that the FBI was actually following, following subversive groups. Seeing fighting and struggling against the government and how they were holding down people, minorities, black people, women, gays, I mean, it just seemed wrong to me and it got fire in my belly about, you know what, I'm not just going to sit here and take this. We were uh, arrested for obstructing a sidewalk. We were arrested because of who we were. Three-day holidays, they would pick us up on Friday and wouldn't let us out until Tuesday. And then the police wanted to cut your hair, which was horrible to the girls because we had grown all this long hair and beautiful locks. A lot of the queens protested and got into fights with the cops because that was something that they could hold on as, as being a female. So we went to gay bars, which were very dreary. People were afraid. They were told not to stand close to one another because when the police came in, they could be arrested. It could be considered solicitation. If the light bulb flash, that means that we were going to be raided at any time. So either you have a chance to get the heck out of there or get raided and get thrown in jail. They would lock the door and shut the lights outside after everybody was in, and then you could dance. There was two exits in the back that mm -hmm. you could exit. So when the cops raided the place, you could run out of either exit from the back, you always stayed by the back, mm -hmm. never by the front. How because, often did the police raid? Oh, uh, maybe three times, three times a week. I can remember going to rallies where you could even see the FBI guys like standing behind you with their American flags on their lapels. I mean, you knew they were FBI. Right. And then they would like, you know, target certain people, jump, you know, into the street, push them in the street, a car would come up, they'd shove them in. I mean, this wasn't paranoia, this was reality. And this is hearsay. All the bars, the gay bars, were controlled by the mafia. All the cops, beat cops, went in there and got their payoffs. I can vouch because I was at Keller's one time and I saw the cop come in and the bartender give him an envelope. 
we didn't have a sense of freedom to see who we are. It's like, you have to do what I want you to do. You cannot do anything else, or else we're going to beat the hell out of you. The police didn't give a shit about us because we were trash. We were nothing. We were just making money for the bars and the bar owners. It was a survival skill. We had to survive no matter what we had to go through. When do you think did the gay community switch from being sort of ashamed of itself to being out and proud? In 1961, I remember the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on television saying, equality is for everyone. And he didn't just mean one group or another group, but he meant everyone. And so then I realized that that included myself. So when my boyfriend asked me in the fall of 1965 to help the street kids, the only thing I could come up with was to emulate Dr. King. He had me meet the kids on the streets. So, so for about two weeks, I heard the kids' stories. Uh, broken homes, parental abuse, people being rejected because they were gay. The kids that came into the Tenderloin changed their name to start a new life because the majority of those kids that were in the Tenderloin were thrown away like trash. The kids were starving. Some of them uh, resorted to prostitution. And so I wanted to try and help the kids get out of that lifestyle. So I actually asked almost all of the kids, were they willing to demonstrate for equal treatment, acceptance, and an end of discrimination? And in the majority, most of the kids said yes. They said they had nothing to lose. What inspired you to really get involved? The Vietnam War protesting sort of made me see that you could make a difference if you had masses. The women's movement was just starting. Of course, as a woman, I was able to jump on board. I was identifying first just as a woman, not as a lesbian, because I was still, I mean, I had only just come out. But as a woman, uh, there was a lot of things going on that made you feel powerful as a woman and that you had an opportunity here to really make a difference. So the first thing that we did was we swept the streets to show that the kids really cared. They weren't the trash. They swept the trash away. Then we started demonstrating against businesses that had discriminated against the kids, told them they weren't wanted. We went to the Golden Gate uh, Cinema, we demonstrated there. Different businesses that told the kids to leave, we demonstrated there. The Gay Liberation Front was big on campus and I joined that. They sort of showed me, we can organize the same way as the women's movement did, but we need to fight now for lesbian rights. What kind of things did you do to further your cause? We were radical in our little tiny way. A dozen of us would go out to like Farrell's ice cream uh, parlor, whose owners were notorious for being against gay people. We would go in there, saunter in there, get a booth, and then we would hold hands and make out until they threw us out. But that felt good because it's basically saying to you know, a pillar of society, screw you, you know what? We have a right to be who we are too. We joined the groups and start fighting, and we did fight the, uh, the cops. There was, must have been around 15 of us. And one time we ran and we caught up in a dead end alley. What the world are we gonna do now? And he says, J do not look, see anybody, just run. So we did. We wind up at one of the bars near Keller's, just went in like nothing had happened and sat down and had a drink. And people were talking about it. They were tired of putting up with it. They were tired of being hauled in for no reason at all. One morning in August, Dixie came into the doggy diner, still with eyeliner, makeup, a blouse. Dixie's a drag queen. Yes. Got it. Dixie Russo. And uh, asked for coffee and a roll. And the person behind the counter said, no, I'm not going to serve you. You have to go home, change your clothes, and wipe off your makeup. So Dixie took the sugar and threw it down and broke it. So he could then called the police. The next thing, we were surrounded by 17 people in riot gear. And uh, we were within uh, the doggy diner for about five hours. And wow. the, the, the two paddy wagons and the police just stood out there. So finally, they withdrew. But when we left, it, it felt like liberty. Everyone really felt elated. They felt that there was such a sense of freedom. 
And we had been going for months uh, from the fall of 1965 up until August of 1966 where people had gained respect. They realized they deserved respect and they were demanding respect. So that night was the Compton's riot. It was just one of those ordinary nights that all the girls would come to Compton's cafeteria to drink coffee or just hang around to see what the night would, would bring. Every night at around two or three, we, we would hang, we gather around to make sure that we had made it through the night. The cop came in, started harassing one of the girls. The girls threw a cup of coffee at the cop. I knew there was a commotion somewhere in, in the cafeteria. And then's when the cops decided to call in reinforcements. And if you're cornered in a corner, you're gonna fight. No matter what, no matter who they are. Everything broke loose, they broke windows, a policeman came in, there was, it was a total riot. Girls threw sugar shakers and salt pepper shakers outside the window, they, they burned the newsstand and cop car, a cop car was overturned and put on fire. But what happened is the next day, we weren't in the newspapers, we weren't televised, we were in the radio. To have that kind of publicity in the Tenderloin for, where all these, this group is, is running all the gay bars would have been really bad for them. It happened and like it never happened. It was three years before Stonewall. How did the activist movement kind of grow out of meeting people in the bars, on boats, in people's houses? For me, I said, this is not right. I joined the Cesar Chavez on a couple of their marches. I said to myself, what is it producing? I didn't know. I was doing the activism, but I didn't know I was doing the activism. I was just doing it. Then I realized that it was just fighting for the rights of what you believe in. Do you think that the civil rights movement and women's movement impacted the transgender movement? You have to remember we were kids. We could care less about no movement. We weren't even worried about joining a group or being fighters. It was the social thing. It was relying on each other. It was a gay community coming together. And it, we were blacks, we were Asians, we were Mexicans, we were white. We were all one community. And as young as we were, we didn't know if we were gonna be alive the next day. It was just that we had to do. We could not be in the closet because if we were in the closet, we wouldn't be who we are today. And a lot of people were raped, beaten up, murdered, thrown in jail because of who we were. And there's a whole bunch of heroes behind this. After Stonewall, it opens up the doors for true, real activism. And that means fight for what you believe in. And you don't stop fighting till you get it. And even though you get it, you still don't get it 100%. We had a message with Stonewall that we were not gonna put up with it. We wanted an identity. We wanted to be treated with respect. Did you know how big of an impact it would have on today? I still feel that way. I still feel like a rebel. Um, so it did impact me quite a bit. Did I know that those movements were going to be so historic as they certainly are? No, I didn't know. It goes back to civil rights for me. I should have the same civil rights as every other person in America, but I don't. I don't consider myself a pioneer. I, I have been embedded in my mind that I was unworthy, trash, 
what I did, it came from him. It wasn't a, a made up thing. Oh, I'm gonna do all this and I'm gonna get all these awards later on. You've seen so many different social movements. How have those changed over the years as you've watched them and participated in some of them? I think they lose their focus. And you can't do that. You can do it if you don't care about it. But it's not a weekend focus. It's a 24-7 focus. Today, it seems really disjointed. I don't see any one group like driving uh, on one issue, especially not nationally. Um, things are much more sophisticated now if you think about gay organizations that are making an impact like uh, the human rights um, campaign, marriage equality, um, you know, they've got lawyers and they're fighting it in, in the court and so on. I am just absolutely proud of all our transgender uh, our leaders today. I never dreamed that I would see all this uh, movement with the transgender community. A lot of our lesbian and gay community still to this day don't accept us. We're supposed to be LGBT, but the T is only used when they have uh, grants for money. I want equality within the LGBT community. I want the T in LGBT to no longer be silent. So this was a youth-led movement. Teenagers. Yeah, that's really amazing. How would you recommend that youth today stand up and defend their liberties? The unity is really important. We stressed in Vanguard that everyone accept everyone else and not discriminate amongst ourselves. I think that kids today shouldn't feel ashamed of being gay, lesbian, transgender, um, and totally accept themselves. The times are much easier. The youth of today don't know how good they have it. Because in our time, there was no support group. There was no groups that we could count on. Learn our history. Plan who you want to be and go for it. Because there is no way in hell today that anybody can stop you from getting an education like we were at that time. I would like it to be more radical because I think passion can move mountains. So my advice to young people now is to Take it down to a bite-sized piece and at least start there. If you go do it in your community and I go do it in my community, then we can win the battle. It's going to change courses throughout your life. Mm -hmm. You're going to change from maybe gay issues to straight issues to children's issues, whatever it is. Mine has. But I think that once you have activism in, inside of you, you don't get away from it fighting for what you believe in, it's not easy. I'm 69 years old, I'm still fighting. Getting your message across is even harder. But once you get the message, then they get it. I think we can learn so much from the people who are older than us and have seen so much more than us. You know, you can learn a lot more from a person than you can in a history book. Hearing it from somebody who actually lived through it and hearing it from somebody who actually instigated it was just amazing. I'm really overwhelmed by all the stuff that I've just learned from Felicia. I think that her story is extremely inspiring. I have two moms, and after this interview, and after learning everything I did, it's really interesting knowing how that's possible and how, you know, my family and I can be accepted today. It's really hard for me to imagine being gay and having to keep it a secret and not being able to be open as a gay person and as an activist. This national movement was started by street kids and drag queens. The uh, transgender community, you know, didn't think they were doing much, they were just living their lives. What Gabriel said about how we have to be an activist 24 seven and not just on the weekends and when we have time, but how this is a movement that we have to be fighting for all the time and it's tiring and it's hard, but it's gonna be worth it at the end. <laughs>